Okay. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I really like talking about perception. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a fun topic. All right, so perceptual constancy refers to the fact that we see objects as appearing the same even when they cast different images on our retina. Our assumption, based on our models and our experience in the world, is that the world is constant, that you know things don't just randomly change size, that things don't just randomly change color, that things are pretty stable, that sometimes the light reflecting off of something might be giving us an incorrect Im impression or that our distance from something or the presence of fog or whatever can interfere with how something appears but that the thing has not really fundamentally changed. So here's an example of color con constancy. We see a consistent color even when illumination changes. Our brain compensates for it. So we're looking at this kind of Rubik's cubic like thing here with the yellow dots surrounding one blue dot in the middle. And you can see that the light is nice and bright on the top side. It's a little less bright on the side to the left and it's very dim on the side to the right. Except for why is the blue one glowing, right? It looks really weird how that blue one is glowing on the, on the one that's in the darkness. But your brain is like, okay, I know that those stickers are still yellow even though the ones on top look so much brighter than the ones on the side. I know that the circle is still blue, even though the light looks different, right? Your brain's making all these corrections. What's interesting is if you take the blue dots away from their background, all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, they're the same exact shade of blue. The one that looks so bright like it's glowing on the darkened, um, you know, shadowy side is exactly the same level of intensity as the one on the top or the one on the side your brain is making a correction for everything else and so that for the you know for the fact that the one on the right is in the darkness and so the blue seems inappropriately bright and that's why it seems like it's glowing when it's on in context but take it out and it's like no it's like that's what color it's supposed to be your brain expects constancy even though the illumination changes and that's what it's looking for color constancy um, how about this brightness constancy this is our ability to see a consistent brightness even though the illumination changes. So you've got a uh, you know, gray and darker gray checkers board and then you've got that cylinder on it that's casting a shadow onto some of the squares. So you're perceiving A to be one of the dark squares and B to be one of the light squares and so your brain sees it as that. You see A and B as different colors of gray even though if we go ahead and normalize by using the same shade of gray going across them and I didn't, I literally, I didn't do anything else except for lay down those gray stripes. I didn't do anything else except for lay down the gray stripes. And uh, now you see the A and B are actually the same exact shade. But because of your brain's assumption that there's light and there's shadow, there's brightness and there's darkness, but that color will remain constant, you see A as the dark square and B as the light square. Um, so your brain takes these things into consideration and makes corrections and uh, makes sure that you see the world the same way. How about shape constancy? We perceive objects as having a constant shape even though the retinal image might change. So we have a door opening. If any of you have ever taken an art class and have tried, or if you've ever just like tried to sketch, I've never taken an art class, but I tried to sketch a door opening and I know that a door is a rectangle which means that the opponent sides have got to be parallel to each other, right? I struggled like you would not believe trying to figure out how to make it look like the door was opening. It, I, I, I made it crooked one way, then I made it crooked the other way. I'm like, how does this work? But of course, to make a door appear to open, the, do the edge of the door that's coming towards you appears to get larger. And so as a function of that, the top and the bottom display linear perspective and you have what appears to be the, those parallel lines coming together in the distance, you actually end up with a trapezoid as the door opens, right? So you go from a rectangle to a slight trapezoid to a significant trapezoid as the door opens. Um, but you don't really perceive it that way because you know it's a rectangle and you know it hasn't changed shape and so your brain just sees it as a rectangle even as it appears to change shape. Pretty cool what our brains can do. 
Now, like I said, there's a show called Our Bleeped Up Brains that imply, you know, wow, look at the mistakes our brain makes. Is it a mistake for our brain to assume that the rectangle stayed a rectangle? I don't think so. It's called our brain making correct assumptions about how the world works. Okay, now here's an awesome picture of a guy wearing some goggles on the right-hand side that is that these goggles are displacing his vision, so he thinks he's reaching out to meet where in his visual field the other guy's hand is, but of course he's off by some number of degrees. You've gotten used to your sense organs providing information in a particular way. So, for example, we went through how the visual system works and how as light passes through the pupil, and then hits the lens, it actually flips over and lands upside down on the back of the retina. You've, you've adapted to that. That's how you're designed, and so that's how you expect the world to come into your brain. Um, we've adapted to the form that information usually appears. We could adapt to something else. We could adapt to information coming in a different direction. They've had people wear upside down glasses, where um, the world first hits a mirror, then it enters our eyes and so it actually ends up landing on the retina right side up. And initially, it's pretty freaky. It's like this guy trying to shake the other guy's hand um, in the wrong position. At first, you know, everything's upside down. But within a couple of days, the wearer will adapt and will be able to compensate for the, the, um, the brain just gets used to it and says, okay, well, the, I guess that's how the information comes from now on. And the brain gets used to it and adapts and starts to treat that new information as though it, it, it's always come in that way. What's funny is when the person takes the glasses off and now the world flips over again and now the glasses are not on their face to get them an explanation for why the world looks upside down and it really trips them out. Because um, you kind of feel like, well, when I take the glasses off, I'll be normal. But their brain has adapted to the information coming in upside down. And so there's a period of time when the brain without the glasses, now it's coming in upside down. And so the key thing is, though, you go back to your more well-formed way of approaching the world much more quickly than how long it took them to adapt to having the glasses on. So whereas it may have taken a couple of days to get used to the upside-down glasses in the first place, it may take an hour to return to normal after they remove the glasses. But the thing is, you can adapt to whatever form information comes in. You get used to it. How about the role of emotion or, you know, fatigue or um, your level of motivation on, on how you perceive and what you perceive. Experiments ha have shown that when you're tired, it seems like the destination is farther than when you're well rested and ready to go. I remember when I was moving to Albuquerque to start studying my PhD, uh, my husband and I drove from Salt Lake City to Albuquerque in one day. And, you know, it's it's doable, but it's a pretty long drive. I can't remember how many miles it is now, but it, it's a pretty long drive. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of like this picture. This is not Albuquerque, but it's kind of like this because um, there were rises in the highway. We were driving on Interstate 40. And um, so you sort of come to a rise, and then you go into a slight valley and then you come to a rise. Every time we come to a rise we could kind of see the glow of the lights of Albuquerque because the rest of it's all pretty much desert and we'd think oh there it is we're almost there and we're tired we've been driving all day and we were in two separate cars and so we were both tired um, and we come to a rise we'd see the light we go okay it, we got to be getting there now and then we go down to the valley and then we come to the next rise and we're like oh my gosh it's still only a glow it's still you still can't actually see the city. It seemed like we never were going to get there but then once we settled in, we weren't tired, we took a drive and got to that same distance, it wasn't that far. It just seemed so far because we were tired and we just wanted to get there. A target looks farther when your crossbow is heavier. They actually did an experiment where they gave participants um, a crossbow and asked them to estimate how far away the, the target was. For half the participants, the crossbow was a normal one that weighed whatever a normal crossbow weighs. And for half the participants, they had put lead and stuff inside the crossbow to make it heavier than it seems. And the ones who were holding the heavier crossbow estimated a farther distance to the target, um, kind of implying that when you have a you know, heavier pack or something like that, um, distance are going to seem farther away. A hill looks steeper when you're wearing a heavy backpack than when you're wearing a light one. A hill looks steeper when you've been listening to sad music 
than when you've been listening to happy music. A hill looks steeper when you're walking alone than when you're walking with a partner. Um, so all of these factors go into how we perceive our situations and how we make sense of you know, the situations that we're confronted with. Um, so these are good examples of emotion, physical state, you know, your level of motivation, you know, what's your mind on, um, stuff like that. These are actually really new areas of psychology. And um, when you want something, I don't know if you like banana splits or not, it just looked like, you know, like super indulgent to me. So that's why I grabbed this picture. Uh, but something that you desire um, looks closer than something that you don't really like as much, which seems to move away. So, um, you know, these factors make our perceptions a little off. And I, this might be where we might be able to argue, you know, our bleeped up brain right, that our brain sometimes misinterprets our circumstances based on how tired or how, uh, you know, distracted or, um, you know, how burdened we feel. And so that's slightly a different thing than um, some of these other bleeped up brains examples that we've been talking about. How about ESP? Extra sensory perception. Can you perceive information without it having to come in through your sensory organs? Hmm, kind of an interesting topic. Sure would be fun if it's true, right? And some people say um, we all have the ability to perceive things without it having to come in through our eyes or our nose or our ears or whatever, but that some of us are more attuned to it than others, things like that. Um, I don't know if we can perceive things without them having to come in through sensation. I can tell you that there are different types of ESP that have been asserted. There's telepathy. Um, being able to read messages from other people's minds. Um, if you've ever seen Johnny Carson do Karnak the Magic... Uh, no, wait, actually, that's not mental telepathy. He's um, supposedly reading what's written inside of an envelope. That's not telepathy. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if, like, Long Island Medium is supposedly a type of telepathy because um, she's supposed to be able to communicate with spirits. So I don't know if she's reading their minds. I don't, I don't know. Um, clairvoyance is the thing that Karnak, the mu magician, used to do, Johnny Carson, um, where you can see remote events. So he would um, do this. And he, his, it was a total joke where he would um, predict what was written on the card that was inside the envelope. And then it would always be like a crazy, you know, basically a joke. Um, but, you know, people who call the police and say that they um, are psychic and that they think that they can provide some help in solving a crime typically are clairvoyants who claim that they could see the victim running through a field or they could see from the killer's perspective or they could you know that kind of thing um, that's clairvoyance sometimes they claim it comes to them in a dream stuff like that precognition is when you feel like you know the future before it actually occurs I actually have a demonstration of this that I tend to do in class because it's a pretty cool demonstration. It's not um, me actually having precognition. It's a trick. Uh, and I can explain to you really quickly how it's done. And actually, the fact that I can explain to you how to demonstrate precognition should uh, cue you that there are ways to make it seem like you have these skills when you really don't have them. Um, assuming that people who claim that they can talk to the dead are claiming telepathy. Let's use that. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of John Edward, who, who was one of the first guys who was on TV and stuff saying that he could talk to the dead. And he had a show called John Edward. And uh, he lost his network show when it was revealed that there were microphones in the green room where all the audience was queued up and waiting to come you know, take their places in the audience. And they, um, the, the microphones picked up the audience members talking about, you know, who they're hoping to contact and um, the circumstances of the deaths and these kinds of things. And it became really clear that this was not a guy who can communicate with the dead. It's a guy who, um, you know, can remember stuff that he heard from, you know, people's conversations. And, you know, that's the thing. I, I watch Long Island Medium looking for any kind of clues for how, you know, how she's getting prepped. Because the um, there's actually, right now, there's a competition, uh, you know, like a 
contest that they're doing where um, she can she'll come and give you a knock and shock where you'll win her coming to your house and giving you a reading and man I would love to win that because you know if she could completely cold come to my house and tell me things about people who have passed on without me giving her any clues or any interview ahead of time or any kind of information ahead of time I would love to see that I mean literally but as a scientist I really strongly doubt that that's what happens I really you know am under the assumption that there has to be you know pre-interviews and stuff like that where um, she gets some insight and then based on your response to the stuff that she says then she t sort of tailors the reading um, that's my guess but the thing is all of these um, types of ESP are being tested by psychologists to figure out if they have any basis in fact and none of them have stood up yet uh, there's a uh, one guy down at the University of Arizona who has found some evidence for clairvoyance where he has one person in a room um, actually I think this is tel telepathy he has one person in a room focusing on these abstract shapes and then another person in another room supposedly trying to collect the information about those shapes and then report what shapes the other person must be looking at and they the the person who's supposedly reading the other person's mind um, he's gotten better than chance performance uh, now I don't know if that's enough to to claim there's mental telepathy going on but um, so he's gotten a little bit of evidence that it it might be working at better than chance um, but really the attempts to test ESP are really important for psychology because a lot of people um, think that psychologists just want to say no there's no such thing as that and that they want to close their mind I was just watching an episode of the Big Bang Theory and um, Leonard and Penny got in a big fight because Leonard couldn't believe that Penny went to a psychic to get information about her future and uh, she said um, well you're too close-minded to listen to the facts and he said no there there are no facts and of course um, you know if you're scientific in your approach to um, things it makes you look close-minded your skepticism looks like you're just being a naysayer but um, you ha we have to as psychologists test these claims so that if it really exists it would be awesome to find that out if there is such a thing if there is a person even one person who can display any of these types of ESP capabilities um, without any kind of trick or anything involved in it um, that would refute the null hypothesis that there's no such thing so we need just to be able to test and find even one person who can do it and then we can start to study the mechanisms but so far we have not been able to find even one person who can actually display these kinds of skills under controlled conditions where there's no way that they could have gotten the information some other way or use some kind of trick my precognition trick is super simple and my students never figure out what they they of course are nice and, and wisely skeptical and they know that there has to be a trick but they never on their own figure out what the trick is and it's so s stupid and simple that it's like even I can't mess it up in front of a group of people it's that stupid and simple but nobody can think of that stupid and simple of an explanation um, that's the thing is that a lot of times we um, get we get swept up by distraction and stuff like that and we don't notice right in front of us that it's a trick so just to wrap up the ESP issue psychologists are studying this because if we do find even one person who can display one of these skills um, and uh, there is no way that it was done through a trick that's going to be really important information for us as far as how the human brain works so we are really interested in this topic um, so far no data to support any of these kinds of ESP okay so that wraps up chapter six so I will see you guys in chapter seven and you better be ready for some learning all right